Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, as usual, with a very special component to the end of our show today. Jim, we start with the good, and it's not usually that we celebrate more and more Americans embracing the idea of socialism, but it could be very good heading into uh, 2016. You, Gov, uh, asked the question, socialism versus capitalism, uh, which do you prefer back in May? And at that point, it was a two-to-one margin in favor of capitalism. And as Austin Powers might say, yay, capitalism. Uh, the, Demo- <laughs> the Democrats at that time were split evenly 43-43. Independents uh, preferred capitalism 52-22. And Republicans 79-9. to They've asked the question again. Capitalism still leads overall 48 to 25. Republicans, capitalism still leads 72 to 11, although you have to wonder about some of those people. Independents, we still had 43 to 18. But among Democrats now, 49% have a favorable impression of socialism compared to just 37% for capitalism. Jim, if we can't win with that setting of the table, I'm not sure what we can win with. What's most valuable to us out of this is you look at the overall toll numbers. Uh, independents and Republicans are not hearing the siren song of socialism. Um, we'll get to the, some Republicans in a second. But look, independent, that's an 18 percent favorable for socialism, 43 percent favorable for capitalism. You might want that capitalism number to be higher. But look, after the Great Recession, after the uh, reckless behavior on Wall Street and, and Lehman Brothers and things like that, it's not surprising you'd see a little bit of people souring on it. The important thing, I think, to us is that the Democrats are way out of step with the rest of the country on this. Uh, but obviously, Republicans. One thing jumps out at me, though, Greg, like, who are these 11 percent of Republicans who <laughs> feel favorable about socialism? Do they do they sleep through the 80s? Are, are, they, are they just not listening to anything at all, at all, ever? It'd be kind of fun like define socialism. And if they say, well, I'm really social. <laughs> right. That's probably it. That explains a little. You know, I'm on social media, so that makes me a socialist. So. Alla Pundit over at Hot Air was commenting on this, and he said, what you're seeing here among Democrats and some independents isn't a strong swing towards redefining themselves as socialist. I think so much as the term socialist losing any stigma it may have held. And he says part of that's due to the fact that we haven't been aggressively combating socialism since the breakup of the USSR about a quarter of a century ago. So there, there could be some of that. Uh, young people, of course, are flocking to Bernie Sanders, and most of them don't remember the Cold War. And so that could be a major explanation there. One quick observation, Greg, and that's that. So you could think back to, um, you know, the, the self-described you know, today. Well, name a country that's socialist. Cuba, where people will go onto rafts. Life is so miserable, they'll rather swim through sharks. Yes. You can go North Korea, right? You know, right. Obviously, no. People would say, look, if you have no food and you have no functioning economy, are you really socialist? Okay, I'll give them that. But again, North Korea dec- describes itself as socialist. This is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, the USSR. Oh, no, no. It's, uh, the National Socialists, going back to Nazi Germany. Now, you t- in your typical argument with your crunchy Vermont-dwelling college Birkenstock-wearing you know, self-described socialist, they'll say, no, none of those were real socialism. Those were all diet socialism or, or fake socialism or, or socialism zero or some other label. Now, here's the thing. If everything that describes itself by the label that you like turns out to be one of the, among the most malevolent and evil and, and cruel forces in human history, isn't that a sign that it's a bad thing? <laughs> yes, it should be. There's a comedy sketch about two Nazi soldiers looking at me. Do, do you realize we have skulls on our heads? Are, are we maybe not the good guys? Doesn't that, <laughs> doesn't that make us kind of look like the bad guys? And again, if every, every malevolent force in life labels themselves socialists, maybe socialists aren't the good guys. Just, just, let me just put that in the back of your mind there. But no, no, no. There's some sort of pure, clean, happy socialism that thrives in Denmark that, that completely balances out all these other <laughs> nightmarish uh, experiences in human history. Yeah. Ask the people of Venezuela how that's working out right now. That's, there you uh, go. Yeah. Golden. <laughs> they, I'll avoid the off-color joke about toilet paper. <laughs> All right. On to the bad martini. I'll take your cue there. Joe Biden, the 48-hour deadline might not be the 48-hour deadline. But yesterday, just as we mentioned that during the three martini lunch, we found out that he might not hold to that. But then we heard from Ed Henry that three different sources close to Biden say, yeah, he's definitely been talking about that he's going to get in this thing. There was a congressman who tweeted out that someone he knows who's very close to Biden says this is a done deal. He's going to run. Others say not so fast. It might not be within 48 hours. It could be in the next month. Jim, uh, this is just getting ridiculous, and uh, it shows a guy who can't make a decision. 
on the one hand, we shouldn't be surprised by this. On the other hand, at some point, Mr. Vice President, you got to make this decision. I believe the filing deadline for some of the states is early next month. I, I guess what's driving me crazy, Greg, is the fact that it's, you know, it's always 48 hours away. Yes. It's starting to turn into the sequel with Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte, another 48 hours. <laughs> They've had more family meetings about this than, uh, than the Keatons on Family Ties. <laughs> Dad, if you want to run, then run. Okay, come on. Let's get on with this. My suspicion is, and I think the suspicion of a lot of people is, he's decided, right? He can't still be in a point of indecision. So now it's a question of reaching out and all that stuff. Yesterday, Ed Henry said that he had three sources. There was a Democratic congressman that was tweeting that Biden was in. But everyone said, but wait for the next 48 hours. I, just for comparison, Greg, last night we finally got the Star Wars trailer. Yes. And that was awesome. My feeling is the trailer for Biden 2016 isn't going to be nearly as awesome. Insert your Charge R. Binks joke here. <laughs> what do you make of the uh, media's back and forth here? They love the idea of Joe Biden. Then Hillary did okay in the debate. Ah, we don't need Joe Biden in this race. And now that uh, he's doing the tease again, they're like, oh, Joe Biden. We're so focused on Joe Biden. We'd love it if he got in. You know, I stand by my original theory, which is that he actually would probably be tougher to beat for the Republicans than Hillary would. When we and I joke about him, we have a smile on our face. Yes. When we joke about Hillary, we kind of have this like, Ugh. We, we just can't stand the thought of her. We kind of have this sense of bemusement about what a Joe Biden presidency would be. It might be terrifying. Probably every bit as liberal as Barack Obama. But one, I think you know, Biden has a better chance of holding together the Obama coalition, even though he is, you know, half the things that come out of his mouth don't make any sense. He just kind of rolls with that image. We all remember the, the, for some reason, the onion joke about him cleaning his Trans Am in the driveway <laughs> on a Saturday morning. Like it just sticks in our head and I don't understand what it is. <laughs> I think that between that and the obvious natural sympathy for his family tragedies, there is something much more likable about Joe Biden than Hillary Clinton. And if you haven't taken away from the last two presidential elections that charisma and likability matter, then you just haven't been paying attention. So in a way, if if Biden chooses not to run, which I'm still, for a long time, I still think if you want to run, you run. You don't constantly do this endless Hamlet, should I or shouldn't I, waiting for Godot, it goes on forever routine. My suspicion is that if if Biden jumps in, he actually has a much better shot at getting the nomination than everybody thinks. I think he'll probably be a little tougher on Hillary than everybody expects. I think she will go all out against him and she'll look bad for that. And we will see how it all shakes out. But uh, my suspicion is, is that actually, as much as we're having fun with this, uh, if you want to see a Republican president taking the oath on January 20th, 2017, you probably want Biden to take a pass on this. I just want to wait and see if the media will chase his motorcade like they chased Hillary's van that time in Iowa across (laughs) the field. That's how excited these people seem to be about uh, Joe Biden, a a guy who didn't even make it to the first contest the first time he ran and Mm -hmm. uh, immediately dropped out after Iowa in 2008. But uh, well, I had a series because it was so like people getting glimpses and signs. And do you see it? It disappeared. (laughs) And the Post apparently posted an article. The Washington Post put up an online article announcing that Biden was running, but they said they put it up in an error and took it down after a few seconds. (laughs) Um, It's starting to feel like Bigfoot, you know? (laughs) Loch Ness monster UFO people. I've seen a, I saw a Biden 2016 sign and then it disappeared. You know, it's it's like in the Bermuda Triangle. You see it for a second, and then it disappears. So. Well, uh, as Joe Biden takes months upon months to figure out whether he wants to get in this race, former Virginia Senator Jim Webb has apparently decided that two hours plus is enough for him on the public stage. Uh, after one debate where he spent most of his time complaining that he didn't get more time to talk. Politico reporting that Jim Webb will announce today that he is dropping his bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. In an email to reporters on Monday evening, Webb's campaign said that he was considering an independent run uh, for president, but that decision wouldn't be made or announced at this particular press conference. So, Jim, uh, I think most people probably couldn't have picked Jim Webb out of a lineup prior to the debate, so I'm not sure exactly how much support he would get if he ran as an independent. But we did mention last week that he was by far the most rational person on the stage. So it's probably not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, I'm already hearing some folks uh, lament that they think this might actually, if he runs as an independent, he could be a factor in, in Virginia. Now, a couple observations here. One is, you know, what Jim Webb was originally famous for being Reagan's secretary of the Navy for about 10 minutes. Okay, I exaggerate. But like less than a year, he got very frustrated and he quit the job in protest. Runs in 2006, beats George Allen, but remember by less than a half a percentage point, right? right? In 2006, which is a phenomenal Democratic year, this is George Allen after the Makaka incident. In pretty favorable circumstances, you know, Webb ekes out a victory. 
gets to the Senate, apparently doesn't like it there, finds it kind of frustrating, has no interest in raising money, and chooses to not run for re-election. So the joke I had when he said he was running for president is that, well, we know if Webb gets elected, he'll quit after one term. Um, <laughs> here we are, and he's been in one debate with the Democrats, apparently very frustrated that he didn't get enough time and that Anderson Cooper didn't call on him often enough and he didn't get enough time to finish and all that stuff. So he's out of the party. Are you detecting a theme here? <laughs> As much as we may kind of prefer his stance on the issues, there's kind of this ornery impatience to Jim Webb. And kind of the flip side of this is that he's barely ra- – he's raised less than a million dollars last quarter. I mean that's Lincoln Chafee levels. <laughs> and you want to be president of the United States, you have to raise money. Like that's, that, you know, that's what keeps your campaign going. A presidential campaign is not a speaking tour. It is not a book tour, right? You need people on the ground. You need to hire staff. You need to keep things mobilizing. You can only do so much with with volunteers and stuff. And Webb has shown very little inclination to do any of this stuff. And the flip side, the, the other side of that is if you want to run for president as an independent, you have to go out and start getting signatures. Do you think there's going to be a grassroots army out collecting <laughs> signatures to get Jim Webb on the ballot in all 50 states? I doubt yeah. it. Could he do it? Sure. He just has shown no inclination to do this kind of, you know, kind of the basic blocking and tackling of politics. Yes, he probably will get on the ballot here in Virginia. But I would point out, Greg, and, you know, you you live in this state as well. I don't see uh, – he was not nearly as had the high profile of Mark Warner. He was not a major player in state party politics. And after he announced he wasn't running for re-election, he just dropped off the radar screen. Right. So it's not like he's an enormously influential figure in, in Virginia state politics. Could he hurt Republicans? Sure. Virginia could be a very close state in 2016. But um, I, he's, he's just kind of a strange figure here. That, you know, A lot of times he makes a lot of sense, a great author. But um, one, he seems surprised that he no longer fits in today's Democratic Party. And, and secondly, not really clear where he goes from here and where he thinks he's going to go from here. OK, as we promised at the beginning, today's a very special day this week. Marks five years of the three martini lunch. When Jim and I started this podcast, the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. A few weeks later, Republicans took the House and made gains in the Senate. So, Jim, I'm I'm sure we deserve a a huge amount of credit for that. In the past, on our (laughs) anniversaries, we have uh, looked at uh, different clips on the day of. We talked about a couple years ago, uh, our first crazy martini was Jimmy McMillan. He's the guy who was uh, the rent is too damn high party. And last year we looked at the one from, I think, four years ago where we were both uh, talking about how Bob McDonald was the greatest thing that ever happened to the Republican Party. And uh, he's, he's the bright, shining star for the future <laughs> of the GOP. This one is just one of our favorites. It doesn't really even have to do anything with politics. This is from January of 2011. It was our crazy martini. There was this massive bust of organized crime figures in New York. We didn't talk at all about the uh, al- alleged crimes or uh, what was going on or the the detailed, in-depth investigation needed to bust all these guys. No, we were just having fun with their nicknames. Take a listen. Tony Bagels. I just picture somebody saying, don't mess with them or I'll smear you all over the sidewalk. <laughs> um, the other one was, there was one guy who was referred to as Junior Lollipops. And Greg, that doesn't strike me as a terribly intimidating nickname. That, that you're not even full Lollipops. You're Junior Lollipops. Um, and I'm looking at the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and they've got Luigi Minoccio, known as Baby Shanks, Big Tony, <laughs> guy named Nerves. And then there's one name named Angelo Spada with no nickname. And I'm just sitting there thinking, wouldn't that be kind of disappointing to be a mobster and just not get a nickname? Absolutely. You feel like <laughs> you're not appreciated. So, uh, what do you think of Angelo? I, I think we just call him Angelo. I, I don't see anything distinctive about him. He doesn't have big thumbs. He doesn't have a big head. You know, he... <laughs> Uh, one guy had the nickname Firehawk, and I'm sitting there thinking, is he dressing up at night and setting criminals on fire or something? It's a very Marvel Comics superhero nickname. But. I particularly like Vinny Carwash. I, my suspicion mm. is that he launders the money. Uh, and, and another one of my favorites, and this is a guy whose appearance has apparently changed over the years, a guy known as either Fat Dennis or Little Dennis. Uh, so either he's been in there a long time Fat or <laughs> – he was fat, Dennis. There's like your, your Nutrisystem uh, commercial waiting to happen. So there you go, Jim. Not one of our traditional fair martinis, but uh, a good encapsulation of how much fun we have here. That was a good one. I uh, I think we need probably one well, we should have 2016 uh, Republican presidential, uh, presidential candidate uh, mobster nickname. <laughs> Angry Potato. We'll let you figure out who that one is.
Anyway, it's, been, it's been a good couple of years, uh, Greg. Keep it up, and uh, you know we'll, we'll come up with new nicknames in the years to come. Exactly. Looking forward to it. Happy anniversary to our listeners as well. Thanks for your loyal listenership. Jim, you're actually off for the next couple of days, so we'll talk to you on Friday. See you Friday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And tune in again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.